Okay, I think we're going to go ahead and, and get started. Uh, welcome to today's uh, second uh, webinar pertaining to uh, international trade. And this specific um, session is going to be on international banking products and, and tools that, that anybody who's doing exporting needs to be aware of as ways to mitigate your risk. And uh, we're going to wind up having uh, Mr. Jonathan Bricker, who is the Vice President of Commercial Banking at Arvis Bank, uh, talk to us about that topic. And uh, <clears throat> Ms. Heidi, if you can go to the next slide. What, what I want to make you aware that uh, you can submit questions uh, through the um, uh, system there. Uh, in, in some cases, if it's something that I think uh, needs to be addressed immediately, I, I will do so. Otherwise, we'll wind up uh, asking Jonathan these questions towards the end of the of the session, but do feel free to to um, submit questions. And I also want to let you know that uh, uh, Arkansas. Uh, yeah, go ahead and go, go to the next one, if you please, Ms. Wood, uh, Ms. Ms. Heidi. Um, Arkansas Manufacturing Solutions, which is a, a department with the, within the Arkansas Economic Development Commission, is sponsoring uh, these series of trade-related uh, webinars, and uh, their mission is to assist manufacturers to maximize enterprise value by assisting uh, companies with innovation, operational excellence, sustainability, and leadership development. And uh, we have the District Export Council. You see the banner behind me there. Uh, we're the ones that are, are executing these webinars uh, as part of the uh, nationwide district export councils and we represent the Arkansas District Export Council and I'm the chair Rudy Ortiz and the mission of the various uh, district export councils or DECs as we call them is to encourage and support the exports of goods and services that will strengthen individual companies stimulate the US e economic growth and most importantly create jobs and we're here to be able to help you in any way by mentoring and providing different kinds of training pertaining to exporting. Uh, today's speaker is Mr. Jonathan Bricker, who is the Vice President of Commercial Banking at Arvis Bank, and he's going to be talking about different uh, banking products and tools that can be utilized and should be utilized to uh, mitigate the risk to uh, exporting efforts on your part. And he's also a, 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 a member of the District Export Council, so he's more than ha happy to help you in any, any way that he can. Uh, and discuss various uh, ways of making sure that you, you do exporting in a safe fashion. And Mr. Jonathan, if you will go ahead and take it away, would appreciate it. Sure, absolutely. Thanks, Rudy. And uh, Ms. Heidi, thanks for all your hard work on getting these presentations uh, organized. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Like Rudy said, I'm Jonathan Bricker, and I'm a commercial lender. I'm located in Rogers, Arkansas, and I have a focus on um, the CNI and uh, helping international based companies potentially relocate to uh, our state um, for the promotion of job growth and economic development. So that is kind of where I've uh, found my passion here as of uh, recent, thanks to the uh, District Export Council and the AEDC, as well as the World Trade Center up here in uh, Northwest Arkansas. But today we're going to be talking about uh, international trade products to make it to where, say, you catch an order overseas. It's not big and scary, and it doesn't have to be. So we're going to uh, show you uh, how to mitigate some of the risk uh, going forward on that. So let me see. I want to make sure I do this correctly. Rudy, can you see my uh, presentation yep. okay? Sure, sure thing. Outstanding. All right. Well, there's my name, my title, and my address. So if there are any questions you don't feel like asking uh, today in the chat, then please feel free to shoot me an email, and I'm more than happy to uh, set some time aside and, and visit with you on those questions. So uh, banking products. So I'm trying to move that out of my way. There we go. All right. So right now, planning on the front end, when you catch an order uh, from a client 
overseas and you're thinking about exporting to that country and to that client, planning on the front end will make both sides that more comfortable on that transaction. Uh, and it also makes your company look more sophisticated and experienced, like you've done it plenty of times. And that's what we want. We want them to, we want your client to come back and say, man, doing business with company XYZ was super simple. I'll definitely come back to them for the next time. But the big key on this is risk mitigation. We need to make sure that before you ship goods, you have your funds secured. So some of the products that we'll be talking about are, or some of the uh, yeah, things that we'll be talking about today are the uh, payment methods that will be used in this, uh, trade credit insurance, working capital, as well as foreign exchange. So here is the life cycle of the exporting process. Sorry, my screen keeps jumping around on me. There we go. All right, so, you know, sales contracts, you're getting ready for that. You're developing the relationships. You build the in infrastructure. You have the logistics down, and now you're managing payments and finances. You notice that the payments and financing are towards the end of the transaction. Well. Don't let that take away from how important it is. Um, as our international banking manager told me one time, she said, a sale is just a gift until you get paid. I started thinking about that. I was like, man, that is so accurate. That's a great way to, to say that. But um, I want to touch briefly on the developing relationships aspect of it. Because the financing and the relationship they, to me, go hand in hand. It's not easy to form these relationships, especially with clients overseas, um, but it sure is easy to lose them. One bad transaction can just leave a bad taste in their mouth. So that's why the payment methods are so important. And as Rudy alluded to earlier, the District Export Council, we can help you, you know, develop those meaningful relationships, um, meaning, you know, both sides are, are happy with the transaction. And we can help you with the entire uh, life cycle of the exporting process. So getting paid, um, you know, some of the biggest things are, you know, your buyer's financial condition. You know, you may have an order and your invoice size, you know, is, is substantial, which is great, but can they pay? They may want to buy your product, but can they? And even if they have the capabilities, will they? Um, and in what you know, what kind of time frame um, is your merchandise? Is it customized? Which we're going to talk about that uh, a little bit later as well. And then external things like political risk that you know you have no control of. But in addition to what is listed here, it's important to decide. Also, when the risk of the damage of the goods trades hands. So, you know, from the seller to the buyer, when does ownership take place? Um, that is crucial. And those are called eco terms. Um, I know that we've done a few seminars on that and we'll probably do some more going forward uh, through the District Export Council. But those are, those are crucial to the contract and those need to be sure to be explained and agreed upon up front. Nobody likes any kind of surprises, especially in something like that. So here's the different methods of payment. As you can see, um, cash uh, up front, that's to the seller's advantage. On the bottom end of that, the open account, that's to the buyer's advantage. So what we try to do is try to find the sweet spot right there in the middle to where both sides are happy. You know, Walmart, great account. They operate on open account. So you're excited to get a transaction done and your product into Walmart, um, but they're going to pay you. They're, there's no doubt that they're going to pay you, but on an open account, you have no control of when they're going to pay you. Um, so go down the line there, a confirmed letter of credit. 
basically that is layering a U.S. bank's promise to pay in addition to your client's bank's promise to pay. So, you know, a, a bank like J.P. Morgan, Bank of America, you know, the, the big five banks, they've got branches all throughout the world. Well, that's what a confirmed letter of credit would be on top of, um, you know, their local bank's letter of credit. Most of the times, um, we'll tell you that a confirmed letter of credit maybe isn't really worth the cost, but it all depends on where you're doing business. Um, you know, Argentina, Brazil, South Africa, Turkey, some of these countries are most impacted um, by the availability of the U.S. dollar. So in, cer in certain countries, you know, we do recommend stacking those up. Um, letters of credit, we will dig into that a little bit deeper, as well as documentary collections. I'll explain to you what those guys are. So uh, cash in advance. Cash is king. Uh, most of the time, people, that's how they accept payment is cash in advance. Um, if you have a highly customized product and you're seeking a large dollar amount, of an advanced payment, um, we can, because sometimes you may need that money to actually manufacture that product that you're going to sell um, overseas. So we can help you with a, it's called a pre, -ex, you know, it's your pre-export working capital needs. But we can offer the payment to your clients, a refund, um, it's called an advanced payment bank guarantee. So say that they, sh they send you a big chunk of money so that you can buy the supplies to manufacture the product before you ship it to them. Well, if, you know, your company falls down and isn't able to do it, well, then we can help guarantee that your client will receive their down payment back. Um, so that kind of helps, again, mitigate. It's all about risk mitigation, um, and that helps mitigate the risk for your client going forward. But I implore you to not limit everybody to cash in advance um, because, you know, on smaller invoices, when you're asking for cash in advance, you know, that's fine. But they may want to increase their order size, but they can't, you know, that month they can't afford to send you all the cash up front that they have because then that would strap them going forward. So that's why you know, these products are in place to actually help you increase your order size, increase your invoices. Let their bank determine how much your client can order from you um, because they'll work on terms on that side. Um, letters, was that the one I just did? There we go. Um, credit card payments. You know, I've, I've had quite a few clients um, do those. I'm not a huge fan of them. Uh, and I've seen it in the past where someone gives you an order, they pay with a credit card, you verify that it is shipped. And next thing you know, you've got a, um, a payment dispute where the credit card company will cancel. Um, and you've already sent the goods. You've, there's, it's completely out of your control. So not a huge fan of credit card payments. It kind of depends on the situation. Um, like it says, they are small ticket e-commerce, but just, just be careful, um, you know, trust your gut feeling and be cautious when you are accepting credit card payments. Um, letters of credit, they have several options here. Um, and the beauty of it is you are taking the credit rating of your client's bank as opposed to the credit rating of your client. So I, I would much rather have that as a possibility, especially when it's somebody that you don't know very well, you haven't done business with in the past, um, you know, and you're still trying to establish that relationship of trust. Um, that is definitely when I would, you know, remove that situation altogether. Both of you can sleep better at night knowing that you guys both have a letter of credit in place. So here's the, uh, the process of the letter of credit itself. So we'll start there at the bottom. Um, 
where it says contract. So you guys as exporters, you're there on the bottom right hand side of the screen. You're the ones manufacturing the product. And you guys have a contract with your buyer and you've both agreed to eco terms at this point as well. This is where you would make sure that you have that and your terms, your payment terms set up front. Um, do it all on the front end so that there's no surprises on the back end. So then following that light blue line, you know, your buyer um, is going to work with their bank to get a letter of credit into place, which then your bank here locally um, will work with your buyer's bank directly. And then we would reach out to you and say, hey, listen, we got the application, we got the letter of credit, your client's bank promises to pay. So you're good to go. So at that point is when you ship the goods. Um, you work with your freight forwarder, you get all the documentation that you need, your bill of lading, your invoice, your purchase order, everything along those lines. You send them to us, which in turn we send to your buyer's bank and to your buyer, all while the goods are in process. And then at that time, you follow the green and it eventually makes its way over to you once the goods are received or depending on you know, what your INCO terms are that you guys set up. Um, that payment process could happen at various um, stages of the shipping. Uh, the benefits of using the letters of credit, you know, to your buyer, um, which is the importer, you know, they, they work with the freight forwarder and the freight forwarder says, hey, listen, the goods are on the boat, they're on the plane, and they are just like you ordered. So you should be happy with the product that you bought um, from these guys. And you know, for them, the, the payment is made after the shipment is out of your control. Not saying that anything shady would be going on, but again, you're still trying to establish that trust. So that's, to them, that's mitigating their risk and knowing that the product is not gonna be tampered with uh, before it gets to them. And for you guys, the exporters, you know, you, you have the buyer's bank underwriting the buyer instead of you underwriting the buyer, which will help you increase terms that you may offer to your client. Uh, because like that top line says, it, you've got assurance that that payment will be made as long as you did everything that you said that you were going to do. Uh, documentary collections. Uh, very similar to a letter of credit, except for the fact that, in fact, you know, documentary collections, we kind of call these letters of credit light um, or a diet letter of credit, <laughs> if you will. But, uh, you know, with documentary collections, you are, you, the bank is not liable for the payment like they are in the letter of credit. So you are underwriting and you're taking the credit of your buyer. These are less expensive than letters of credit because the bank isn't as involved and the bank doesn't carry the risk. Um, you and your buyer do. But the benefit that they have is that both banks are involved to look over the documentation and make sure everything um, is in place uh, for the transfer of the payment and the documents. Um, you know, and for you guys, the exporter, it's really only appropriate to do this um, shipping goods via ocean, not via air, uh, because the main control of this is the bill of lading, because that bill of lading shows ownership of the product. So once the ship arrives, your buyer gets to the port to pick up its goods. Once they have that bill and lading in hand, they own that good. So that's why the document um, document collections are better for ocean as opposed to via air. Open account, you know, we touched briefly on this. Um, great if you're dealing with larger companies like Walmart because they're not they're typically not going to do cash in advance. They're more than likely not going to utilize the letter of credit. They've got stellar credit rating. Like I said earlier, you will get paid 
You just don't know when. So you're going to ship the goods and just wait for your payment. Um, you know, and that kind of depends on, on your risk tolerance. How long can you wait? Um, but, you know, there are some options. You can either go insured or uninsured. And we'll touch briefly on that. Um, let's see. Best practice is to be proactive. Don't feel bad stating what you want up front. Because I guarantee you, your client isn't going to. They're going to ask for the moon. And, you know, the job of your international banking partner is to help you guys meet in the middle and get that transaction done. So decide what's the best thing for them. Decide what's the best thing for you. Um, you know, and name your payment method up front. Name your Inco terms up front. Um, you know, letter of credit, it can be used as a source of payment. Documented collections, not a source of payment, but it does have a uninterested third party in between to make sure everything is, is done correctly. Um, the main thing is on the bottom is work closely with your banker and your freight forwarder prior to shipment. Cause you got to make sure everything is, um, as, as it is sold in the contract. You don't want any kind of discrepancies because there could be uh, an opportunity for them to either reject the goods or uh, question the payment. Uh, credit insurance, you know, many companies use these. Um, there's quite a few considerations when deciding if you're going to obtain, you know, receivables credit insurance. So the first place I would start would be a, a good broker. Um, there are multiple companies, and if you were part of the first session, there were you know some of those in XM Bank. Um, I believe he he touched on those uh, quite a bit. But um, make sure you have a great broker who can support the documents, and um, and make sure that you. Uh, comply with the insurance company's requirements. If your buyer isn't already on the list, you need to allow time for the insurance company to underwrite that buyer. And that's about a eight to 12 week process um, for them to do that. So just, you know, plan, plan accordingly, if you will. But, uh, you know, some of the things that you have to take into account, the pricing, the structure, the underwriting, um, and the underwriters that we were kind of talking about, Exxon Bank. You know, it's the official export credit agency of the United States federal government. So uh, that is public. Uh, we have some other private uh, insurance companies, such as you or Armies, that will take a little bit more risk. Um, but some of the things you have to be prepared for, and most of them are outside of your control. So that's why you have the insurance. You know, say that the company files bankruptcy or they just, you know, fall apart. You know, how, how are you going to make sure that you get paid? As far as the political aspect goes, you know, we kind of spoke about Argentina and some of those companies. You know, what if there's, I mean, Ukraine, perfect example right now is, you know, Russia is knocking on their door. There's, you know, there could be war there. So we need to make sure that where you're shipping to is that you are covered on the financial aspect of, of things. So here's the working capital um, cycle. You know, it, it's funny because um, on my notes on, on this one before COVID, I had that the, the typical average day of sales outstanding were about 68 days. I cannot begin to put a number on that uh, right now. Um, I mean, it just, it's fluctuating. It's all over the place. So I just went ahead and took that part of, of it off altogether. But, you know, what is important is that no matter what number those days are, that's how long your receivable is outstanding and you don't have that cash to turn around and order new raw materials for the next order. Um, but there are some banks that will lend on your insured international receivables. 
again, going back to the insurance. But um, yeah, just kind of keep that in mind about how long you could be without the cash. So number one thing you can do to help yourself is, um, you know, access to capital, be bankable. You know, I, I say that all the time and, and what, what does that mean? You know, to be bankable means that your business is able to receive uh, traditional financing from a bank. Things to take into consideration to get you to be bankable is, you know, your personal credit score, your time in the business, um, your profitability uh, in the past. Um, you know, use the bank, use your banking institution for all of those things because your treasury management, your payables receivables, your deposits, you know, your credit cards, because that gives you a history with your preferred lender. Um, and one of the biggest favors that a business can do for itself um, from a lending point of view is to have accurate and up-to-date financial reporting. That is absolutely crucial. Um, and, you know, I tell most people, hire it out. You didn't start your business. You didn't start your company because you, unless you are a bookkeeper, you didn't start it to become a bookkeeper. You did it because you wanted to manufacture your widgets. You wanted to, you know, get out there and sell yourself, sell your product. Uh, you don't want to sit down really and balance the books, you know, on a monthly basis. So, so hire it out. Um, that's what the expert companies do. And I, I highly recommend it. So 58% of small businesses have exported um, of some point in time. And out of those small businesses, 98% um, of them are small firms. It's the, it's the mom and pops that are wanting to, to generate new revenue or different forms, you know, sources of revenue. If COVID taught us anything, it's to don't put all your eggs in one basket and just have, you know, one to two clients. You have to expand. You have to look at different sources of your revenue and sales. As you can see, exporters, you know, 44% worry about not getting paid. Um, you, you don't have to worry about not getting paid. You use these international finance products to make sure that you get paid. Um, and most of the time, the small firms don't offer terms to their foreign buyers. You know, it goes back to that whole cash in advance. So you're kind of limiting to what the clients will buy because the invoice size and the, and the cash that it takes up front. So we have a couple of uh, export options here. You know, one, um, for an exporter, your needs, you know, you need working capital, um, you know, for the production and for the supplies, your raw materials, but you also need it after you ship the goods, um, your carrying costs, going back to that, you know, day sales outstanding. Um, and then the other thing that you may need, you may need that cash for, you know, fixed assets. You may have to buy a machine that, you know, molds your widgets to what your client is looking for. So you're going to need those funds um, to help improve your process and your goods. Um, a couple of different, you know, options here. 7A loan guarantee. The SBA is charged with helping U.S. companies export U.S. goods. Uh, for economic development, uh, which in turn uh, creates job growth that we, you know, briefly spoke about earlier. Um, not typically used as much as the other two, but the um, that international trade loan, it's basically a, a term loan um, for a specific project. Um, but, you know, the SBA will guarantee as far as a working capital program and things along those lines, um, you know, they'll guarantee 90% uh, of your working capital loan with your bank. 
um, which will allow you to utilize your cash and your other collateral to continue to grow your business. Um, as with every SBA loan, there's going to be a bank involved. So I highly recommend that you find a strong bank with plenty of SBA experience. The Export Working Capital Program, it is utilized for access to the cash so that you can fulfill your order that was placed by your international buyer. And this is for all your export working capital needs. Um, I also invite you to go to the sba.gov website um, or you can just call your friendly international banker. Export Express, um, it's a fantastic program um, and it can be used in either a term fashion or a working capital fashion. So you can kind of structure it to, to your needs. Um, export, you know, some of the features of them are listed below. Um, you'll definitely want to ask your bank if they are a SBA preferred lender because that makes the process even simpler since they already know your banking habits. It goes back to that whole banking, being bankable that we were discussing earlier. And with that, with the uh, Export Express, the underwriting is done in house. Um, so your bank has the ability to um, kind of expedite the process, if you will, and help you, you know, promote your exports. Um, in fact, you can kind of see there, I mean, it's ideal for export promotion and development needs. And that's what your working capital line can go towards. Um, and in fact, speaking of the, the promotion, the export promotion, um, Myself being a part of the District Export Council, Rudy, but there's 35 of us. Um, and we can introduce you to the people at Arkansas Economic Development Commission or the amazing people at the Arkansas World Trade Center that I alluded to earlier. Everybody there are subject um, matter experts in their territories that, that they are assigned to. And they're instrumental in helping Arkansas-based companies um, during the export process. In fact, they can also help you to what's called a, a step grant. Which, um, it's a grant. It's not a loan, um, but it helps offset some of the costs uh, associated with establishing international business, um, whether it's to trade shows or travel to meet a client or whatnot. But um, if that is of interest to you guys, then I'm more than happy to make an introduction for you. Uh, foreign exchange. I know it can be extremely scary, but um, what foreign exchange does is it makes it easier for your client to do business with you. And it gives you a competitive advantage over some of your other domestic competitors. Um, so if you can issue a dual invoice and allow your clients to pay in their currency, like I said, it makes doing business with you that much simpler. And you can still protect yourself. I'm, I'm not going to get into a you know, ton of conversation on this right now, but I mean, foreign currency fluctuates. Every 30 seconds, it's changing, but you can hedge yourself um, if you decide to accept a foreign currency. And it's very important for you to have that conversation with a foreign currency uh, provider, either with your bank or, you know, a broker before, before you quote anything in a foreign currency. And I beg you, please, please, please do not just go to Yahoo Finance and be like, oh, well, you know, that's what the uh, peso is quoted at today. So that's what we'll use. Don't do that, please. <laughs> reach out to professional. Um, and I say that because, anyway. Um, some frequently asked questions, you know, on here. What What is the political risk? What is the commercial risk of the area that I'm trying to export to? You know, I've heard you guys talk about letters of credit. How do I 
figure out the cost uh, and can I spend a little bit more time learning exactly what it is? All of these questions on here and things that we have spoke about earlier, um, your banker would definitely be able to help point you in the right direction as well as your CPA. Um, other than that, I'd suggest reaching out to some of the attorneys that we have on the District Export Council. Um, or like I said, your CPA, but make sure that that CPA has international experience. Uh, you don't really want to be learning this uh, together at the same time. You need to make sure that you speak to one that has the experience to uh, do that. Um, partnerships are key that I referred to at the very beginning. Um, District Export Council, use us. Um, there's no question too small that we will not, if we don't have the answer, we will introduce you to someone that does have the answer. World Trade Center, Commercial Service, AEDC, SBA, um, your banking relationship and your freight forwarder. These guys are uh, crucial to making sure that everything goes smoothly for you on the front end. Because we, we all want to see you succeed. Because if you increase your exports, then again, we go back to the whole economic. It, it creates job growth because you've, you've got more that you need help, hands with, but it, it helps Arkansas succeed. So, you know, it's not so micro, it's on a macro scale. So if you do well, the state does well. And that's kind of how I think we all, all view our work within the District Export Council. And anyway, that is it for the slideshow. If you guys have any questions, like I said earlier, that you don't feel comfortable putting into the chat, uh, you are more than welcome to reach out to me directly. Um, email me, and I will, I will get back to you as quickly as I can. And like I said, I may not have all the answers, but I bet I know someone that knows someone that does have the answers. Anyway. Thank you, Jaffa. <clears throat> I appreciate that. A great presentation, a lot of good, good information. And, and ladies and gentlemen, we recognize that this is a lot of information. And uh, we're going to be making the uh, the slide presentation and uh, um, available to you and, and the recording available to you within 48 hours. And so, you know, use it as a, as a reference to, to go back to you and and you get these this information that you need to be able to be safe and to to do exporting in a in a, a good way that that is going to mitigate as much of the risk as possible and make it as profitable as possible. I also want to remind everyone that this coming Thursday we're going to have two additional webinars in the same time frame from nine to ten o'clock. Uh, and Heidi, yeah. So from uh, from nine to ten o'clock, we're going to be talking about currency payment risk management. Um, and um, then from ten thirty to eleven thirty, uh, export credit insurance. And so you'll need to go ahead and sign up for those classes by going to the DEC website, which is exportarkansas.org, and then look for. The, the, the classes that, that we're putting on and register for each one of them uh, individually. And um, if you have any questions, please feel free to, to contact me. Uh, you can do so. Uh, you can uh, do so at, by emailing me at uh, rsortiz1953 at gmail.com or you can contact Heidi yeah, there's there's my uh, there's my email address, or you can contact Heidi Whitman, who is the deck coordinator at coordinator at exportarkansas.org. Feel free to, to contact us with any questions that you might have. And as Jonathan said, we're here to to help you in any way that we can, not only but providing um, classes, webinar classes at, at this time. Uh, on a ver wide variety of trade-related topics, but also mentoring. I mean, we're, we're happy to talk to you one-on-one -on -one to answer any questions that you have. And we have uh, a, a laundry list of, of professionals in a variety of areas that, can, that we can pull in to answer very specific uh, uh, topics and uh, provide you the guidance that you need to be able to do it safely and professionally and, to, and, and profitably. So with that, we will go ahead and um, um, close the, the webinar. 
thank you so much. You have a, a wonderful and blessed day. Thank you again. Thank you.